Today's episode of Juluminati Podcast is sponsored by Podcorn. And no, no, it's not a food. We've been doing Chiluminati now for a while. And if you're one of the many people out there who have a podcast, you're well aware of how headache-inducing trying to find sponsorships can be. Recently, however, we've been using Podcorn here at Chiluminati, and for my way of doing things, it is fantastic. Once you get your podcast all signed up and the RSS feed synced in there, you immediately have access to a huge site of listed current ad campaigns and sponsorships all going on as we speak. Each campaign tells you what they're looking for, the budget they're working with, how many ads they have to offer, and more. Any and all of those first basic questions when initially negotiating a sponsorship are taken care of, and you can get right to pitching your podcast as an offer directly to the company. And whether you have a podcast just starting or you've been going at it for a while and you want to explore new sponsorship opportunities and start monetizing your podcast, you can do so by signing up at the link description below. Now, on to the show. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chiluminati podcast. I I said last time it was episode 52. It was episode 58. I think we're on 59 now. Something like that. Anyway, I'm one of your hosts, as always, Mike Martin, joined by my two co-hosts, Jesse Cox and Alex. What? I'm just tripping out. That seems like too many episodes. What's going on? Right? It does. We're 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 over halfway to a hundred. What are we at? Year five, year six now? We're in. We're almost halfway through year three. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw year someone seven, tweet yeah. yesterday. Uh, what happened to fifty nine? I had no idea what the hell they were talking about, and now I understand they meant episode fifty nine. This episode. It's it. That's what we're at, or we're like almost there, or something along those lines. Well, now I'm I understand why people want to yell at me <clears throat> on the internet. It makes more sense. I was, dude, I give up trying to figure out why people are yelling at me on the internet half the well, time. Well, that's because you believe all their nonsense things they tell you. Well, they're like, Mathis, <laughs> Mathis, the other day, a leprechaun came up to me and said, I'll give you gold if you give me a soul. And I tricked him, I did. And I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm. But I, I, listen, dude, if he could share the gold with me, I'd believe it. All right. That's all that's, all that's going to happen. All right. Give me a little bit of your cash and we're in good shape. <laughs> share your gold and I will say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yep, pretty much. Also known as Patreon. What's up, Alex? Oh, God. Hey, did you know? That we, the Chiluminati, have one of those websites called the Patreon at patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod, where you can keep this happening once a week, just like it is right now. Nice and cushy. We're up in our production values. We need one more person on our squad to make our audio nice and crispy, cinema quality, 7K HD, uncompressed audio. That's where we're headed. Uh, we literally psychically transferred into your ears. Yeah, you're just going to hear it and you're not even going to have, you just think and it gets quieter. That's none of that's true. We're just going to have good audio and that's our next goal. You can support us now. And after this episode, if you <laughs> want to listen to us more, good news if you're on Patreon because you get 15 more minutes of our mini sode, which is coming right after this. It's up now. Patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. No one can chill like you do. No, but you know what? It's a talent. Real big thank you to everybody who's given us their money to keep us Honestly, rolling. Yeah, it's uh, these episodes are a direct result of just being able to pour my life into this thing. So we're going to dive back into Roswell, the Roswell incident episode, uh, the series of episodes, rather part two. Now, uh, where we last left off, boys, we'll just get right into it. We covered the uh, first few weeks that led up to the crash. Uh, It crashing into the ranch and the bizarre handing off of materials from the ranch to the army that then was flown off. Um, The army had established a perimeter around the ranch at this point, and nobody at all was allowed in any longer. But it was a small town, and this is this was not Roswell proper, remind you. Roswell just kind of inherited the lore of the of the crash because it was the closest kind of quote unquote big city. Let's let me let's be real. Roswell ain't a big city. And a lot of these cities that they're like, yeah, go. uh," It's like when you go to air 51 and they say along the way, like go stop at the uh, little alien and go like, go to these. That is a town with one building and a like three mobile homes. And that's it. It is not a town. It's more like, it's more like Roswell is the only like, city at all like any right. sort of anything yeah 
Um, and in today's episode is going to be a prime example of how not big Roswell actually is. <laughs> um, <laughs> <clears throat> however, as we did talk about in the first episode too, there was a second crash and that is going to be kind of the focus of today's episode, but we got to wrap up the first crash. We're only at the end of the day of the July 8th at this point, all of that stuff that we covered uh, at the end, the end half of Roswell episode one was all in one day. We got to wrap that day up and move on to the next day where, <laughs> where crash two is the focus, but focusing Wait, on crash pause, one, pause. did you say crash two crash two, sir? Did you not know there was a second crash? I don't know that I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know that Sam I didn't Augustine. know that. I figured, you it's know. Basi basically, Roswell's in the middle, and the first crash was to the east of Roswell on the ranch, and the second crash was to the west of Roswell over near San Augustine, which we'll talk about. There's, there's this brings up so many other questions to me. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's keep going. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> but with the first crash... We're in a small town. Like I said, we just said Roswell's a small town. So the sheriff got curious again, and he, for the second time, sent out his deputies to the ranch to see if they could find anything else, whether it be wreckage or take a look at the site again or just try to piece together what the hell was going on. But by the time they got there, the military was already there. They were locked down, and they were just turned away. There's just no reason for that unless this is something. For a weather balloon crash, my Yeah, dude. that's what I mean. Like... What they say it is versus their response, like it's the it's the big takeaway from the last episode for me. At yeah, the very for least. sure. And we're gonna we're gonna kind of really nail that in here. So unsurprisingly, the gentleman, uh, the story doesn't end there, and as is expected, it only gets way way weirder as we go into the second crash site west of the first near San San Augustine. The next day, with the help of Brazel, which remind remember was the rancher, they were actually able to locate the second site because he knew the land rather well. So with his help, him and the army, the military folk, were actually able to find the second site rather quickly the next day. They left in early morning as the sun was coming up because they ran out of time in the first day to go find it. They weren't actually able to find it first, however, as a bunch of civilians stumbled across the second site before the army got there. And that's going to be the focus as we begin. Three separate groups of civilians stumbled across the second crash site before the military got there. The first group was a family, the Andersons. They were actually out hunting for moss agate, rock hunting basically, when they came across this crashed disc, they say. Even alleging that they found alien crew still alive, but were unable to communicate with it. The second group was a group of student archaeologists who were out in the desert studying cliff dwellings only just a few miles out. The night prior, they had actually seen the giant fiery meteor in the sky, and the next day, they simply wanted to go see if they could find the meteor to study it. Instead, they found a crashed disc. The third was just a single person, Barney Barnett, who was literally just out surveying for irrigation purposes when he stumbled across the disc because he heard a commotion. And none of them... We're going to go into detail now of each of those groups encounters. Okay. okay I was about to say, I didn't want to jump in yeah. until we were going to, no, no, right. we're not, okay. we're not done yet. Just give right. you I was the just going to say, they just passed each other like ships in the night. No, they did not. Okay. okay. Let's talk. So the first ones were starting out with were the Andersons. Like I said, they were kind of out rock hunting, just looking for moss agate, which I don't actually know what that looks like, but in my mind, it's green. Uh, but I didn't look Alex, it up. This seems like a perfect thing for you, right? <laughs> it seems like a World of Warcraft thing. What? It definitely, it definitely is. Uh, in in WoW, it is like a little. It's a little green gem shape. Yeah. So I know that. I don't know what it looks like in real life, but I know exactly what it is. If I, I'm, okay. I'm going to go to the internet and type it in That's right now. That's why I was like, what? it just reminds me of that. It just yeah. reminds me of WoW. Yeah. And I was like, okay. It is um, definitely an, it's an item that you can get in WoW for jewel crafting. Yeah. And yep, it's just a go. little green gem. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Link uh, it to me, the WoW version. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll link it to you yeah, right why now. Link I love me the you. WoW version. The yeah. WoW version of this. Look at rock. this. Look at this you do right that, there. Look at uh, that. They were out rock hunting, as you do out in New Mexico, I guess. And the group were out wandering around. Assuming, I'm, I'm assuming, like I said, they were just kind of picking up rocks and be like, yes, good, and took it and left. <laughs> but eventually they turned yes, a corner good. out out in Arroyo and were suddenly greeted with what I can only define as my personal crash ship wet dream scenario as a human being if i turned the, the corner and i was describe it listen to this <laughs> listen to this okay you gotta listen to this there dug into the ground 
tilted at an unnatural angle against a tree. Was me. Was a supposedly. Naked. Yeah, I was there. Was real. <laughs> was a supposed real physical crashed flying saucer. Gerald uh, Anderson, the younger, uh, the younger sons, his father told him to stay back as he and the older boys approached, leaving maybe uh, 50 or so feet between the two of uh, the crash site and the little boy. There had been a large gouge in the earth where the ship had clearly careened through with trees knocked over along the way. Small fires were still crackling nearby. Now keep in mind, this had crashed the night prior or the day prior. Then as the older brother got close, he simply exclaimed, and I sincerely quote, this is not a joke. <clears throat> and I, I'm just going to go Southern drawl here. Oh no. Oh, my apologies in advance. <laughs> That's a goddamn spaceship. <laughs> Them's Martians. That's that's Mathis in his bedroom at yeah. night. He's yeah. mouthing it as he's sleeping. That's a goddamn spaceship. I do it. <laughs> oh, so Them's Martians. Them's Martians. Them's Martians. Them's Martians. So this guy Them's knew, Martians there. knew the idea of Martians. Clearly, in some way. Okay. I don't know when aliens became public, like very popular public knowledge, but this is 1947 to give you an idea of the year. That As is a good research out, point. When did when was the first like uh, well War of the Worlds was when? That's an excellent question. The, the broadcast? Yeah. H.G. Wells, when did you do that? War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells. Up, the book came out in 1897. The Orson True. Wells version is War of the Worlds the, 1953. So, so Yeah, that so, seems about right. But but if the the original is like from the 1800s, aliens are not a foreign concept. No, that's 1953 way. is not right. It was before that. That's the movie, the radio drama. Yeah, yeah. What's the radio drama? I need Here to look is. this up. This 38. Is, it's 38. 1938. So yeah, okay. yeah, there would have. I mean, here's the thing. There's a lot of debate about whether the Orson Welles things, like the radio drama, actually was as world ending as people thought right yeah but uh it still doesn't matter it was out there in the ether so all right i mean yep. i guess you can go with preconceived notions of what aliens are uh you know i'm gonna put <laughs> it out there that maybe he saw a crash and it looked otherworldly and he was like aliens and it might not have been but who knows please continue a well, saucer from another the, world just like yeah. the Orson wells cereal <laughs> <laughs> as he pointed out and exclaimed them's martians he pointed out three of the saucers crew members that were on the ground Two of them were splayed out, stomach first, on the ground. Oof. While oh, one was the leaning. captain. That one there's a navigator. And that, <laughs> there, that, that, that there's the. He's the custodian. Which one schlorps? I think they are all schlorpers. Like I feel like that's like yeah. something you do. Like that's like fun when you go out as an alien. <laughs> you just schlorp. It's a night of schlorping. It's like when you eat the heart uh, when you like go tuna fishing, <laughs> but it's just like the alien version. <laughs> it's not like eating the worm when you like tequila or whatever it is yeah same exact thing nothing's like go. eating the worm when you tequila please don't you shouldn't do that by the way it's just no, gross. never done it shouldn't do it it's not never like tight it. it doesn't feel good it's, it's not <laughs> hype that's a little party tip for me to yeah. you as somebody who's don't done get everything into that. there is yeah don't get conned into that by you know people my you think last you're cool pre, you know what my last pre-coronavirus memory is is oh, no. being in boston on stage squirting mm. lemon juice into my eyes or whatever the hell i was doing <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that was the last thing we did was a live yeah. show i'll never forget that yeah. Oh, wow. So I've done it That's all. Great. I've done all the stupid shit you can do while you're drinking. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> don't don't eat the schlorp. <laughs> um, well, the, the, the two of them, you made me lose my place. The ones on the ground were not actually moving, while the one up against the tree was seemingly breathing erratically and oh in, clear need, uh, in clear distress. So fucked as up. They, as they approached the bodies cautiously, they saw nearby... A fourth one hiding in the bushes, less injured than the ones on the ground, and it looked as though it had been performing first aid on the downed crew. But when the family approached, it scooted back, staying away from them. Most of the family went to inspect the ship, but the father and Uncle Ted tried to communicate with the one against the tree, speaking English and Spanish to it. It did nothing. And when they would raise their hand as if to show no harm, it would raise its hand back in a defensive manner one would consider flinching. Hmm. Eventually, it would understand that they wouldn't hurt it, and the father was able to place his hand on its shoulder in a comforting way. What? What, a, claim, what a bold claim. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I, but, hey, man. <laughs> uh, 
the family continued to investigate the saucer, noting that even in the July New Mexico Wait, but they heat, didn't go to the one that was in the bushes? They, they When they approached, it backed up. It kept backing away. So they didn't like so they, chase after it. They were like, it. all right, screw it. Let's go to the one that's injured by the tree. Yeah, well, they were trying to talk to the one that couldn't move right. and was dying in front of them. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah okay. Um, it was easier. Uh, I mean, yeah, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the family, the other, rest of the family, the older brothers and whatnot, they, be, they were still looking at the ship at this point. And they noted that even in the July New Mexico heat, the ship itself was cold to the touch. The so ship it wasn't also, it wasn't like absorbing light basically. Like it wasn't absorbing the heat of the sun and yeah. whatnot. Hmm. The ship also had a huge gash in it, about ten free feet from top to bottom, and about three feet wide, where it, with its widest point being in the center. So as it kind of goes down, it kind of goes into like an ovalish shaped gash, with the widest point being in the middle. They also note that there was a nasty smell of something akin to rubbing alcohol or acetone. When they were there, okay, they were kind of picking up those smells. Um, now, this is where we kind of leave the Andersons. This alone, if this was the only claim, would be kind of weird and suspect if that's what it was. But it's not. It is at this point in the events that six others, Dr. Busk, Bus Buskirk and five archaeology students, rounded their way there. Uh, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine being out thinking you're going to find rocks and you're going to study caves? And you turn a corner with your doctor teacher and there's an alien with like some family that's ha rock hunting, like trying to poke the alien. Be like, Hello, uh, can you understand me? And they're both like you were there and I was there like both yeah. of them. Yeah. Hmm. Both independent groups. Yes. That's crazy. So, uh, they were equally surprised and they joined the family in their attempts to communicate with the alien. They then began to use German and sign language, which is what the professor was able to bring to the table. How many people How is this total? So that is a total now of 11. Okay. Five family members, six members of the, of the, of the study, and then one more will be around to make 12 total. Um, so they tried to speak with it using German and sign language. However, they also failed in their attempts. It did not respond. One other person, uh, one other person then is noted to join the group. Now, the story from the group of, of uh, archaeologists and the family group don't name this person. So it's believed to be the guy who said, who's claimed he joined them and said he was out there for irrigation. Um, but we cannot confirm that one way or another. Um, but he was out there checking and surveying the area for irrigation, which sounds like a really bizarre thing to do by yourself in the New Mexico desert, but whatever. And there's no uh, threads between these people like... Uh, Kevin Bacon not openly not openly but again you know Roswell's small there's you know it's an area where people kind of know one another so it wouldn't be surprising if they they still knew each other in passing you know in that town or have heard of each other or, or heard of the professor or with the archaeologist students or something along those lines okay but there's no there's no like admittance of like we knew each other prior there was no connection between them but um, this is one of those things that at the time, they all said we're here or... Yes. All right. That's crazy. <clears throat> However, eventually, shit, the fun's got to stop and mom's going to show up to put the toys away. And playtime with the ship and the aliens came to an abrupt halt when the wheels of the army came rolling up on them through the desert. First to note, the army was fucking horrified when they arrived. With this many civilians around, they were upset and it seems like the army went to panic mode instantly as they arrived and they popped out of their vehicles and they quickly rounded up all 12 people they were very quickly sternly and angrily informed that they had to come across something that was important to the nat to the national uh, the security of the nation and the country and they were to never once mention this again that the government was powerful and could simply discover where they lived if any of them had opened their mouths afterward they why, immediately went to threatening them. Why not just like serve them with like an NDA? Good question. I always think so about in that. this group of, of army officer Marcel, who is somebody we talked about in episode one is here. He's here and, and was, was up at this point. Officer Marcel was told he would be the one taking the wreckage to the airfield. And from there he went. From here, our story is going to jump slightly. Our time with that group of civilians kind of ends abruptly, and we're going to move now over to the plane. 
The, the wreckage from the secondary crash is brought uh, to the plane uh, used to fly the wreckage of the second site. Sergeant Robert Porter was a member of the flight crew for that crash and recalls what they brought onto the plane. A triangle package, maybe two feet long and wrapped in brown paper was brought on board. <laughs> While the other three piece of packages, yeah. <laughs> it's a giant piece of two feet cheese. While the other three packages were about shoebox sized and like, uh, and like the bigger piece, it was also wrapped up. Porter noted that it seemed like there was nothing in the boxes as though the, like, the weight of them was empty. Nothing. Yeah. Empty. Yeah. Not the same plane though. Right. Not the huge. This was all these. And no, this is a different flight. This is not the cra the first crash site. The first crash site stuff took off the day before. Right. That's so gone. they so they didn't come back with the same plane. They came back with an appropriately, this is a different ship, appropriately sized plane. Still 509th, still the fi using the 509th, but right. this is a different plane than before. Right. Things only got more difficult and sloppy from the government as we move on from here as they're in clear panic mode. You can kind of consider this like a, a crisis and they're triaging as fast as they can. Like cover Marcel, up vibes. Yeah, so officer, like for an example, Officer Marcel had arrived at General Ramey's office, another one we talked about in episode one, with some of the debris from the second site. And interested in it, the general had been curious where it had been found. So, leaving the material in the other room, General Ramey took Officer Marcel to the map room so that he, Officer Marcel could show him the location of the crash exactly on the map. Because remember, only a few people had just gotten there. It took the rancher, Brazel, in bringing them there. So they did not know where it was. When, they, when he was satisfied and he understood where the crash was, they returned to the other room only to find that the debris was completely gone and it was replaced with a torn up weather balloon. Huh. All the while, Brazel the rancher was brought back with them to the army base in Roswell, but he was not told to stick close any longer. And so Brazel wandered off into Roswell. Like I said, nobody told him to stick close any longer. And like after he just having left? Such a, he just like, once they went back, every, all the army went into their little official areas. And usually they're like, you're going to stay here. Wait for us. Nobody said anything to him. So he left and, and just went into Roswell. He had a long day and he was just going out to get a walk, clear his head, just get out. So how, so what do you mean replaced exactly? How does that, like what, what literally happened there? They, we don't know. Like they, they just left. spirited the ones away and then brought back like. So they, so yeah, they, they left the room with the, with the Brie in the, in uh, General Ramey's office. They left it there. And then when they came back to General Ramey's office, the debris was gone and it was replaced with the torn up weather balloon. Like they just like bait and switched it to be like, it was just gone when they, yeah, it was, when it was gone, it would just been swapped. Their attitude was just like, yeah, that was what was always there was the weather balloon. Well, we're going to, what happens next is what we all kind of know is, is what happens next. Yeah. Um, this part I think is the part that like the most like reenactments I've seen on TV and stuff yeah. is like after this has happened. Yeah. Yes. Correct. So all, like I said, all the while Brazil had wandered off, according to him, nobody had told him he needed to stick close any longer. And after such a long day of helping them find the second crash site, bringing everything back and ending up in Roswell, he decided to leave and explore Roswell where he would eventually bump into a journalist from the KGFL local radio station. Brazel either stupidly, naively, or bravely ended up telling the story to Whitemore, who was the journalist, who promptly brought him right to the radio station. So we kind of bumped into him, maybe bopped into a bar, had a conversation with him, and just was like, oh, shit, crazy shit just happened, dude. Like, let me tell you about it. And he told him. Whitemore uh, then took him to the radio station, where another reporter at the station with Whitemore took a wired recorder and interviewed Brazel, who told them the whole story from front to back recorded. After Geverick getting everything on record in true spy fashion, Whitemore was then worried that all of this could get Brazel in trouble or worse, and then decided to have Brazel stay the night at his house to keep him out of the hands of the military. So how far, how, how much time has passed now since he, this he, is the, the second day. This is literally the end of the second day after the crash was, was so brought yesterday, in. them, there aliens next day, immediately following that he went on the radio. Uh, no, say it was, he didn't go on the radio. He was just brought to the radio station and interviewed on a wired recorder. Okay. So same, it's a tape on the same okay. night of crash two. Okay. Yeah. This didn't get put out. It was just record on a wired recorder. Interesting. Since that. Um, and like I said, Whitemore got nervous and had just invited Brazel to his place and he's to stay the night. He accepted. Now, during this time, warrant officer, the, the time being the night where, where Brazel is out, 
Warrant Officer Irving Newton was ordered from the weather station to General Ramey's office. This, ladies and gentlemen, is when the now famous picture of the weather balloon being held up happened of the tattered remains of that balloon. That's General Ramey's office where that picture is being taken. One such balloon, this balloon, that's caused two separate crash sites and debris over three quarters of a square mile. Newton, in front of those reporters, identified the wreckage uh, being shown in front of us like a stage in a play, like the, and we accepted it. And he identified it as a Ron target balloon. They snapped a picture of him and then sent him back to his regular duties at the weather station. Job well done. He was no longer needed. Now having the wreckage publicly identified, General Ramey announced to the world that his officers were simply bamboozled by the weather balloons like the goons that they were. And if this is to be believed, during this announcement, Blanchard and his staff arrived at the ranch and were taken to the second crash site where the bodies were covered by a tarp and recovered. A second trip with the different officers to recover the bodies. This was happening while the picture was being uh, snapped and the, uh, and the re reporters were taking their it record. It almost sounds like the same thing is happening twice in two different areas at the same time, almost. Well, there was no bodies in the first crash site. That's all. Right, like that, right. That's the difference. But so, the government's mobilizing, going out, getting yeah. these things, locking it down in both cases. It's crazy. Yep. Um, this might sound be bizarre, and honestly, it's kind of hard to believe, but there's a little bit of actual, um, a little bit more of, I, you can't call it actual evidence because everything, remember, is coming from people's interviews and, and whatnot. But there's a little bit more that we can kind of tease out to maybe say something was going on, whether it was alien bodies, Soviet soldiers, or whatever you want to believe. See, out in Roswell, a local mortician by the name of Glenn Davis started getting weird phone calls later that night. Weird for a few reasons. The first being they were coming from the Army Base Hospital asking very specific questions about how best to preserve tissue, including asking what specific chemicals did to tissue. While he couldn't confirm anything, his personal belief at the time was he believed that there had been a fatal crash at the army base and they needed a little bit of quick help. Now that the public had been properly dissuaded from the idea of something secret happening, the movement of the remaining bits and pieces of the wreckage had begun. An unscheduled flight came in from Bowling Field in D.C. Lewis Rickett transferred a sealed box with some wreckage in it. All the while, Melvin Brown, member of the Squadron K 509th Bomb Group, had been instructed to be in the rear of the truck at the second crash site and was expressly told not to look under the tarp that he was guarding. But people are a curious lot, and when everyone's backs were turned, he took a quick look to find the bodies of the crew underneath the tarp. Basically, he says he saw alien bodies. The truck went from the cr second crash site and transported those bodies to the hospital for examination by Dr. Jesse Johnson, who whom proceeded to pronounce them dead and immediately began taking um, beginning procedures uh, at working on the bodies. Back outside of the base, however, the local mortician, Mr. Davis, under the impression that there might be an emergency at the base after the calls and having helped them in the past, drove out there to see if he could help the army in any way. And having helped them in the past, the MP at the gate simply waved him through without even questioning as to why he had arrived. He drove directly to the hospital in the base and went inside. But he did not get far before a nurse saw and stopped him, warning him to get out right now or he could be in serious trouble. Before getting anywhere, though, two MPs rounded the corner, saw him with the nurse, and literally physically picked him up and threw him out of the hospital. As the night came to an end, a guard at the gate also took note that there was a couple bizarre things happening. One, a truck carrying dry, uh, dry ice entered the base and, was and he was surprised by the late delivery. The bodies were also then sealed into long coffin-like crates, 15 feet by 3 feet by 4 feet, and the crate was moved to a hangar. It was left there, spotlights dancing on it all night while MP stood guard. They never went anywhere near it. And that finishes July 8th, 1947, the second day after the event. We now move into July 9th, Wednesday, so question, 1947. Answers. I hope I can give you an answer. I don't answer. think you can because it doesn't make all of that. There's a lot to it that I'm like, okay, yeah, all right. I understand that that seems weird and that's strange. The one thing out of everything you said that still sticks with me is the fact that they like 
got some evidence, left the room, came back, yeah. and it was different evidence, and they were like, all right, turns out it's uh, this instead. That, to me, so is either my assumption BS is that or like, I don't get the military. My assumption is there's some details missing or maybe, because I guess like they'd walk in, they'd be confused. And then before the press event, they were either informed or they already knew or the general already knew it was going to happen. Uh, maybe. I, I guess. I don't know. It just seems it's weird, weird to me. It's super freaking weird. Yeah. It's super weird. It's, it, yeah. it reminds. It's one of those things that like, you know how sometimes in life something weird happens. And you're like, well, that's fishy. And yeah. you, every part of your instinct tells you that that's wrong. And then only years later, do you discover how right you were to not to like to question that thing? <laughs> yeah. This is that for me. I'm like. That doesn't there seem might be right. Details out there that I just don't have. I understand. So I just like possible. that one moment sticks out like a sore thumb. Like that doesn't seem seems like what you would say if you were trying to lie through your teeth. Yes, I, I'm with you. It, there's this, there's all kinds of the parts of the story that are just like me personally. Like that's weird. I don't get it. Right. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But the way the we, government we acts up. in general, like, do they deny they did any of these things? Of course, they say they we that we did not go out. It was to a the weather crash. balloon, dude. It was a weather well, balloon. What I mean is like. They don't deny that they rolled up immediately with a group, scooped everything into an airplane and flew to Washington, D.C. That's like, the yeah, there's no denial of any of that stuff. That's like to do Which that. Is, but, 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 but remember, there, if it's it could be just something of like a, 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 a national security in that it could be just foreign technology from like another country. But even then, like it's at the military base, like it's not like they were fighting these guys and like, mm. you know, like. It's not like a new discuss. If it's something that they knew about, it's not like something that Washington didn't know about. I don't know why it needs to go immediately to Washington. And so that's right. why that, well, that's the, that's the suspect part is that it's getting flown out instantly. And like, it's all this weird stuff. So hmm. we're going to push on because more weird st stuff continues. July 9th, 1947. As hoped the next morning, the newspapers had corrected the headlines now claiming that the saucer story from before was nothing more than a weather balloon misidentified. All while Brazel was still hiding with Whitemore and Roswell, while Whitemore Sr. was worried about protecting the exclusive nature of the story. His father lived with him, and he was all he was focusing on the cash that could be made on this story. On the base, Robert Smith of the 1st Air Transport Unit said they began loading crates into C-54s early in the morning, but something was really bizarre about the crates themselves. Not the size but that they were so big, but weighed as if nothing was in them. A second person completely separate now saying the same thing. Crates. Both with the military. Yeah. Crates that feel, felt as though they, there was nothing in them. They, I mean, that alone, like if we wanted to start talking like alien stuff, if we just want to take again with the giantest piece of salt in the world, that it was an actual alien crash and it was an actual alien ship. The fact that it was cold to the touch and that it weighs nothing is fascinating. Um, it would explain why they can move so quickly if the if the UFOs that we're seeing are true, like are actual like physical aliens in our atmosphere, and we can never figure out why they move. But if the if the craft that they're on is like light as hell, I mean, who knows? It, it's fascinating. I don't know. I just I don't know. It's just weird. Like the 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 nebulous nature of how much stuff they're moving around. It just seems so weird to me too. Like if it was a weather balloon, why would it need to be crates? Like if it yeah. was if it was a spaceship where did that spaceship go i really don't think it was a, right a weather balloon at the very least like whether it was technology from an enemy country whatever a t their own secret technology they fucked up and, and crashed whatever it is i genuinely think there's so many other better explanations than a weather balloon right but it worked for the time because of the kind of way the, the public mindset was and there wasn't a lot of easily accessible information and most people probably didn't know what a weather balloon looked like at that point and who knows? So I don't know. It's just nuts. Meanwhile. Yeah. So they weighed like nothing and they actually loaded three separate aircraft all headed to Kirkland and then to Los Alamos. So these are three separate craft being loaded with, with crates um, flying to two separate areas or flying to one area in, into like first to one place and the other. Meanwhile, the military, the military realized Brazel had been missing and decided it was time to go find him and hunt him down in Roswell. It didn't take long before they found him, and this time took steps to ensure his security with them. First, they entered the private residence of Mr. Whitemore without a warrant. 
confiscating the wire recording from the media, which is a vi- which, if true, is a violation of the First Amendment. Now, this is one of those things as well where you're like, oh, okay, he had a physical recording. Sweet, where is it? Well, the his excuse and the reason it didn't go public is because he said the the army busted in and literally just took it from him. It is a very convenient excuse and one that's hard to say because the army will never acknowledge or whatever. Um, but even if, and even if they deny, you know, they won't. Nobody will believe them. Huh. Um, furthermore, Brazel was then detained and brought to the base for around five days, unable to contact anyone. What? Yes. Normally, he was kept at the RAAF, uh, at the RAF in question, and they normally would just question him or keep him there and send him out. But this time he was kept there and they questioned him relentlessly for days. The same questions over and over, who he told, what he saw, where he was. And he was also forced to undergo a full army physical examination cavity search. What? They would interrupt his sleep and keep him up for all random hours of the night, continuing with the intense in, uh, in, uh, investigation and questions. Why? You, you want to say something, Alex? No, I just well, like, why did they do that? He went away. He disappeared for a day and he didn't know he wasn't supposed to. And if they if he, he saw a ton of stuff. So they were just like punishing him, anybody torturing him. Not punching him, punishing. but they were keeping him up. Oh, yeah, punishing. Like, very much interrogation. Like, extreme interrogation tactics. That's crazy. I don't... Mm-hmm. It's very bizarre. Um, I don't understand, and, and, though, but okay. Yeah, me either. I don't understand why they would do that. It doesn't make any sense. But but if they believe he gave the secret information and gave it to civilians, they need to figure out who it is, and he's like, I told nobody, or is he... Home? I don't know. It doesn't make, again, it, a lot of this is just bizarre and it just feels like the army panicking from the minute they walk, they discovered these crashes. It just feels like constant panic responses to everything, threaten people, quarantine them off, grab them, interrogate them for five days. It's not, can't be by the books. It's weird. After those five days and they were done with him, they took him into town where he was brought directly to the Roswell daily record there. That's where he changed his story telling them that instead of finding what, what he said he found, the wreckage and the weirdness of it all, that he'd found a balloon on June 14th and hadn't taken it into the city until three weeks later because he had no phone and no radio. Brazel also said in the new statement that he'd found weather balloons occasionally, and with that knowledge, he can actually identify it as such now that he saw it for a longer period of time. So now that he's programmed, like it, like the idea is that he pro- they programmed him and he came out speaking just, their they story? They threatened him you know, interrogated him and then told him he was going to change his story. Okay. And that's what they did. They brought him there, forced him to change his story. If, if this, this, you know, is to be believed. And then, then that's what they, that's all. Um, again, remember they, they're also, he's also saying he found it on June 14th, which isn't true. He found it only six days prior to bringing it in. Not three weeks. Yeah. Not like which a is fucking also month. Kind of bizarre, but it makes sense. If you think of the context that they're trying to disconnect, the sightings and the crash, the weird meteor crash that happened. Right. Because if you line up the timeline and be like, well, the weather balloon crashed five days ago, it caused this huge meteor thing. Nobody's going to be, it's not going to make any sense. But if you say three weeks ago, you can distance yourself and then just say what was in the sky was simply just a meteor and nothing more. It's frustrating because it's another one of those things like, oh, well, if you believe what they say, the government has essentially eliminated all evidence of any other possible outcome. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I don't know. It seems weird, but I don't, I won't know unless I like read some like really deep, like I go and look at all the I can give you the three books that we went through. If you want to go and read it and read the stuff, man, it's crazy stuff. It's insane. Um, After he changed his story or while that was happening, uh, KGFL, uh, the, the radio station KGFL got a call telling them to not play anything related to the crash interview or otherwise under threat of them losing their broadcasting license. The following day, an officer from the base swept through the entirety of Roswell, picking up copies of the original press release and any other signs of the original uh, reports. Frank Joyce confirmed this. He was another person that worked in KGFL by saying that somebody came into KGFL and heavily searched the radio station. Anything that was related to the story or suspected to be was taken. So more cleanup, basically. I th- this is like this is like X Files. Like this is like you know. Mm-hmm. I don't. There's no way to prove this. It's so fr- it's, no, it's there's so no, frustrating. There's no. <laughs> now the mortician the next day was also curious as to why he was so uh, 
the violently removed okay. from the place because he had again worked with the army before and was on good terms with them. So Mr. Dan uh, Glenn met up with the nurse from the previous day. She described why there was such a fuss at the base. She went on to describe the bodies that were transported from the crash sites and also went on to describe a horrible smell that the bodies emitted that was so goddamn bad that they the, the closest they could get was um, about 100 feet without dry uh, heaving and retching. Even the doctors who were used to this sort of thing were throwing up by being anywhere near it. Now, it might... The ammonia and acetone smell from when they when the families found the bodies that might be what's being happening, but at least them being outside, I was able to diffuse enough where there was no gagging whatsoever. How do we know what the what the mortician saw? The mortician saw nothing. Well, I mean, like, how do we have his account? He gave his account, it, and the only and the only and this is the frustrating part as well. The only actual um, saying beyond deathbed confessions of these bodies is this nurse. We have no pictures. We have no other confessions. The mortician and the nurse are our prime source for where, quote unquote, confirmation of the bodies come from. So he said this on his deathbed or no? Oh, I don't, uh, I couldn't. No, no, no. I'm saying beyond like government deathbed confessions. The only confession we had before that was just the, the local mortician and, and this nurse. Yeah, it's just the closer that he, that report or, uh, was taken to Let me when, specify, we can't even confirm the nurse is real. Right, right. All this just comes from the mortician. Right. So depending on what year that was, it lends more or less credence to that story. Because if he, if he took that account in 1975, for example. Uh, yeah, I can give you a quick answer on that, I believe. I'm interested to know, with specifically him, because the fact that he's just like a guy who's like, I saw the bodies and then same thing with the, the three separate groups that saw them at the crash site. I'm like, when, like, when did you guys get together and like talk about that? Because uh, the idea that three groups of strangers met up okay. one night and decided to host. I got your answer right here. Yeah. So here's, here's where you can kind of take this for a piece of, of how you will. Yeah. Um, 1992. <laughs> okay. So the mortician <laughs> that was there, he didn't report on it till almost 40 years later. Or fifty. And he years also later. wrote a book. Yeah. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. So that, again, that's why. Mm, but that's mm, what I'm saying. Like mm, our only. Mm. That's why I say you can. It's like this is the frustrating part. The only real like confirmation that bodies were in the hospital that night and something was going on is the mortician and what he was told by this unidentified nurse. But yeah, but it's also interesting that there were three groups of people that ostensibly saw these bodies out in the wild when they were crashed. You know, yes. Yeah, there's just still weirdness. Yes, those absolutely. guys. I I would spend a whole night just like I would. I would do five episodes just on them, <laughs> just on those people. Yeah, like did they meet up in the middle of the night? Like if it's if it, if if this is a hoax, if they yeah. just decided to, like they needed to say this, the idea that they just met up somewhere one night when they were out on the trail and they were like, well, look at all of us out here. How did we get here? And they're like, <laughs> and they're like, well, we might as well make up an alien crash. <laughs> Like, I mean, yeah, it's weird. It does. It's bizarre. It just doesn't, um, it just doesn't ring true to me either way. Like so we, the fake version of the story, like the version that the government is saying doesn't ring true. And the, and none of that's, a, that's the other thing. None of the versions of the story that we have from official sources, from witness sources, each version is equally unbelievable in different ways. And, that, and it and seems like why, there's, oh, go for it. It just seems like there's empirical evidence for all the stories too. Like you can like point Everybody to it. a bit. Yeah, point to like a piece of evidence that contradicts another like official story. And that's why this, uh, there's a terminology for this. Um, I want to say it's like Roswell, de Roswell, not degeneracy, Roswell something. It's the Roswell, I'm going to look this up. Is this up. like a case study yeah, or something? Ro Roswellian syndrome is what it's called. Um, okay, okay. Uh, Roswellian syndrome is the idea that uh, there are five distinct stages of the myth-making process, and they include the incident, the debunking of the incidents, the submergence, or trying to keep down the incident, the mythologizing of what happens, and then the reemergence, and then media bandwagon, right? And, mm. and it happens again and again and again 
in all these situations, especially during UFOs, when like an incident happens, someone says this happened and then people poo poo it. And then everyone like, you know, it doesn't mean anything. And then it slowly over time, this mythology builds and builds and builds and builds. And because there's so many, you know, like in this case with Roswell, the government gave how many explanations, like a ton of different explanations kept switching their minds and it allowed yeah. the conspiracy to sink in. And eventually <laughs> now it is, it, it is to the point where it's so common that they made a TV show years ago that was called Roswell and it was about two like love aliens. Two yeah. Two of them. And so, so but you know, the, so, so how on purpose is this done by the government? Well, how on purpose to muddle it is, is, is this I, it's I, a great I question. I do have a question. I don't know. Do we mention this in the first episode? Cause I was looking up, while we're talking, I was like, what was the vibe in the country? Because the beginning of this one, I was like, when that dude showed up, he's like, saucers? Oh, Yeah, boy. we did. We did talk a little bit about it, but feel free to rehash. No, I just, I, so I went online, and I was like, what was happening in 1947? And apparently, now you can take this either way. This clearly is information mm -hmm. that if you want to believe, you will believe aliens were around. But... Starting in on July 3rd, 1947, flying discs failed to stir, uh, stir air, for air forces. This is an article from Washington. They were seeing flying discs whizzing yep. 1,200 miles above the Western United States. You know, the government didn't do anything. People were noticing them. They were saying these discs are out there. Then on July 6th, they have wash tubs. Fly, eight flying saucers described as more like wash tubs and each about the size of a five room house were reported today. Uh, and so that's another story. Yeah. Then I, you have another story <laughs> that's dis soar over New York now seen aloft in all colors. And so this is another story about uh, flying saucers above New York. And then there's a thing here that says Australia is talking about flying saucers as well. Then you go down another one disc near bomb test site, just a weather balloon. And then you have this huge thing there. And this is uh, I, I just want to go on a of the army right up now. there. This another article. And then you have another one, right? You have all like, th there's so many articles happening around this time so, period. And so you don't, you know, what? So remember, yeah, we talked, we, we, so I focused simply on the sightings that were happening around New Mexico at the time. Um, the, this all, remember July 3rd, all this is happening at the time, right leading up to the crash. And this was happening across the nation. Yeah. There now, was like if, alien fever. So I can understand why so, I would be like aliens. Like I get it. And the question becomes then is the alien fever. What caused them to think they saw aliens instead of, you know, human wreckage or, were is they it, really aliens because there were tons yeah. of aliens around? Yeah, yeah, that's the big yeah, so thing. If you, I want to go down this path just for a little bit and give kind of an idea because in I, in episode three, I'd really like this, what we're going to try and do is cover MJ, the MJ-12, the Majestic 12. Sure. Because uh, you kind of have to understand that. The big deal. But if you were to believe, and we talked about this in for episode one, just around this time, like we said, nukes were new. We figured out how to split the atom. Literally wanna, two years before. Literally. Two years so before was the first time they were used on people. There's a reason... Yeah, there's a reason for intergalactic intelligence to take an eye on, on a primitive species because a bunch of monkeys just learned how to split a microscopic atom and now they're all around. Now, if you want to go further down that alien rat row and you start learning, think about the conspiracies, this is around the time, according to some who may believe this, that the MJ-12, Eisenhower and all them made their first deal with the greys. So these flying saucers, the crashed ones, the aliens on the ground, these are all greys. And greys are the ones that the U.S. government made their real first deal with. The deal basically was you can abduct people. X number of people a year. You can't. We, we're basically trying not to panic the public. You can have X number of people off solar cycle, wherever you want to fucking, you know, identify it via contract. <laughs> and, and we and they will then uh, give us some technology. Now, you can also go further and say, this is where some people believe the internet actually came from. Wireless signals and all that stuff. Our technology boomed in the 50s and further, and people believe that the, 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 the treaty with the greys and other aliens, there's even some believe we have a treaty with the reptilians and more, that, that that's where our technology, the infanti uh, infancy of the technology came from, and then we ran with it. And that we are an emotionally unprepared, an intelligently unprepared species to have this kind of technology 
for when it's naturally supposed to occur further on in our evolution. Oh, I hate that idea. <laughs> that's, I figured that, you would. That sounds like silly, that's like ridiculous. when. Yeah, but it's also like when people say that that uh, you know ancient civilizations couldn't have built the pyramids, yes. and you're like, oh, I'm with you. What? No, I do. Humanity however, can do I don't, all sorts of crazy ass things that give people the credit they're due, even though it was probably through slavery. The the idea like. <laughs> That in the 1950s, so, we learned all the things we learned from aliens and not from the fact that, like, during World War II, everyone in this nation and around the world was, like, in war mode and everything we they like, made. Yeah, we need to make from machines radar, of war. Yeah, yep, yeah from, yep. like, radar no, to, like, all that shit. And then rockets were developed. And then we smuggled away the Nazi scientists and were like, hey, these rockets are pretty cool. And that, like, we did all that yeah, shit. No. Like, we got to the, like... Oh, I agree with man. you. I'm with you on that point. I don't think we got our tech from aliens or at least tech that we are aware of at this point. Um, what I will if say we did, is that we I don't have flying I don't, cars right now. That's all I'm saying. Unless the aliens want to keep us particularly down. Flying cars don't affect uh, space travel. Give us aliens. If you're listening <laughs> right now, if you hear this podcast, I know it's one is of your easier? favorites. I know it's one of your favorites. <laughs> I need two things before I leave this earth and join you in space is what I'm saying. Uh, Flying cars, sex robots. I know you have both. Make it happen. Thank you. That's my platform <laughs> um, when I run for president. Is it harder to shoot a bunch of monkeys on the ground or if they're all flying around in the air? Doesn't matter. If you have a world destroying <laughs> super ray, come on. Uh, fair enough. Come all on. right, you know what? Fucking fair enough, dude. Fair enough. We're talking I about the say, aliens from Independence Day are real. Right. Ex that's they're right. based on fact. Yeah. Brent Spiner <laughs> is a scientist who works at Area 51. And um, yeah. In that theory, though, I don't I don't say I believe it. I want to believe it. But, you know, the the area the, the point where my belief kind of wavers or would kind of swallow is there might have been a treaty to slow down because it really did kind of stop very quickly. And if there was a treaty that worked out, whether they are using the country for their own purposes or as a Why would stop there be or whatever, a treaty? it doesn't make sense. If you're an alien species and you have the, the ability to dominate another, we well, don't there make might treaties be conventions. with ants. You know, there might be conventions. There might be some sort of government and they have like, you know, uh, oh, dude, I, I think, yeah, there is supposedly a fucking intergalactic government that has rules and there's yeah. other aliens that fuck with us and they break the rules. It's just like some what we do on earth. Uh, when we uh, encounter uh, a new nation, remember? Yeah, but we but we de we deal with na I'm not talking about nations. I'm talking about like when we deal with chimpanzees who are like 99% us. I, we throw okay. them in cages. When I, I, gotta, when I say I gotta, we, you know what? I mean the Federation <laughs> in Star Trek. Okay, right. Of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of dude. course. Um, let me let me say this is something we will absolutely heavily dive into next episode or episode four, depending. Um, because we do need to talk about the MJ-12 and potential treaties. We got to get through the rest of the of Crash 2 and the events that lead up okay. to us being able to theorize. I know it sucks, but we got to do it. Um, so it, it, as I said, like they, they were just kind of doing their thing. Uh, the question then is, what do they do with the bodies? If their bodies were real, if they were brought to the army hospital, if they were dissected and looked at, after that night of dissection, where did they go? Well, apparently... Those flights that we talked about a minute ago, the ones that were bound for uh, Los Alamos and whatnot, the, cr the crates that they were loaded with, most of them had wreckage on it, but some of them contain uh, contained bodies. However, however, apparently on some of the wreckage, there was some markings on them. And those markings I'm familiar with were these transcribed. Too, yeah. I've seen but this. Before we get to the transcription... The other sealed wooden crates that were completely unmarked were loaded into the bomb bay of a B-29 tail number 7301. For any of you, we have a bunch of people, by the way, we learned, they have a bunch of people who are aviation experts out there. We have a bunch of people in the military listening to us. So and the I hope B this is exciting because it's like a, t a plane from Tailspin. It's like the Star Destroyer right. plane oh, from yeah. Tailspin. It's like a plane <laughs> that the Rocketeer would fight on the roof of. Like this is like a big fucking plane. Oh, so it's one of the pirates, like the 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 yes, jackal the, pirate guy. Yeah. yeah. So it is believed that the crate that was loaded under the B-29 bomber was possibly the one carrying the bodies. The only reason we say this and the only reason we have this assumption is because on this B-29 bomber guarding this one crate were six MPs, <coughs> one officer, two NCOs, and three enlisted men, all of them armed. 
They never let the crate out of their sight, according to, uh, to those who, who saw it were there. And at Fort Worth, the aircraft was met by a number of extra officers, including a mortician. But this one employed by the army, not just this some one local officially smug. on the record. Right. This one officially on the record. OK, so the, that's that's all real. That all actually happened for sure. Well, a crate was loaded onto the yeah. B-29 bomber and took off and went that way. Aside from Correct. the fact that it may or may not have c- contained alien Correct. bodies. We, yeah, we can't know what it was containing. But yes, a B-29 bomber with that many people went. And it went to and Texas? It. Yeah, they went to Fort Worth. Why would you fly a weather balloon to Fort Worth from New Mexico? Okay, I think we can safely say it wasn't a weather balloon. I'm just I, saying. I really don't think it was. I just the can't believe that's then, the story. Yeah. Uh, the, again, and if, if, it's, if it's true that they were greeted with a mortician, that basically spells out that Body. the bodies were the things on the crate. It was unloaded, and the flight crew was then told to head right back to Roswell. Marshall returned with them on that flight and was kept in Fort Worth for 24 hours. And that had kept him out of a reporter's line of fire until the cover story could be put into place. So Marcel was brought to where the bodies were. Everybody was told to leave, but Marcel was kept there for an entire day while the new stories broke and the new, the new uh, cover stories were put out into the public. So he couldn't be asked questions. That is Frank Joyce, a man at KGFL, reported that the officers had brought Mac Brazel to the radio station KGFL to also be interviewed. So remember, he went to the Roswell Daily first. Now he's being brought to KGFL. This time, Brazel had a new story, one that was significantly different than the one that they supposedly had recorded on a wired recorder. Joyce pointed out that Brazel said and responded that it would go, that it would go hard on him if he didn't tell the new story. So they were basically like, hey, man, that's not what you were saying. He's, and he's like, listen, I don't have a choice. They're going to fucking fuck me up if they do. And so he told the new story to KGFL. Meanwhile, the flight crew returned from Fort Worth and were not debriefed, but were told that they had flown the general's furniture to Fort Worth. With a mortician? <laughs> but that was in the box. That's their, that, was their, that was their explanation. Was his furniture <laughs> made out of people? <laughs> That's what I'm like, what? Did he have a fainting couch made out of a man's folded Moreover, body? All of them were told not to say a fucking word, not even to their families. There was no flight. It didn't take place. So my, in, my, in, in my head, they're all lined up. And the officer that comes out isn't even trying to hide. He's like, you, you flew a bunch of fucking of the general's officers. Listen, if you say shit, you're all dead. And they just like left it at that. Marshall was finally 24 hours later allowed to return. And he headed right to the CIC office and confronted the officer. Marcel wanted to see the reports that had been filed in his absence, but the officer at the CIC completely refused. Officer Marcel pointed out that he was a senior officer, but the CIC agent literally claimed that the orders came direct from Washington and to take it up with them. And that was the end of it. Yeah. After that, however, the, the Las Vegas Review Journal carried a story later that day quoting a United Press report that said, quote, Reports of flying saucers whizzing through the sky fell off sharply today as the Army and Navy began a concentrated campaign to stop the rumors, end quote. The story also said that AAF headquarters in Washington, quote, delivered a blistering rebuke of the officers at Ros- uh, to the officers at Roswell, end quote. That same article was printed in other newspapers around the country. That just that- seems, if that, if, it was the, if that was today and I read that headline, I would be like, the government can't do that. They can't just like, but they can an, like a, like a anti, like a disinformation campaign. <laughs> well, is it a disinformation campaign? Cause at the time they were touting around, touting around, uh, touting it about as fact that this, this is, uh, there's like one or, you know, the naysayers around this time, if there were many, they were so scattered and there was no way for them to communicate. There was no way for them to really resist what the, the government was doing. And most people just want to go back to their everyday lives and not think about aliens flying over their city. Do you think that if you see an alien, or if you have a sighting, don't, don't ask me what you, I would do if I saw an alien. What I'm saying is imagine like you're somebody and you've okay. been hearing that there's been sightings around and it's the forties mm-hmm. and you see something. Are you automatically going oh, alien? Yeah. I mean, like we, we talked about, yeah, we've talked about this now in both episodes. It's like the time frame, like what would we just say? Right. Like aliens have been around the, the knowledge of aliens at the very least a decade because of war of the worlds. Like it's like, it's, I don't know. I guess it wouldn't be that far of a leap for them to make that jump, you know? Yeah. 
It's just, it seems, it's like some human psychology shit, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, I just don't know. It sucks that, like, the moment they were like, it's a weather balloon, like, report stopped, because yep. that seems to, like, you know... But if, if lend- our peak within KGFL is a truth to the matter, then the, then the government was calling everybody and being like, we will revoke your broadcasting license if you say a word. Right. Yeah, so it's... It's one of those things again. Yeah. So after all that, that remember that was just all in one day. That was Wednesday. Yeah. That was Wednesday the 9th. That finally brings to the close July 9th of 1947. And that's where a majority of the activity pre and up to the crash takes place. The 10th, 11th, all the way up to the to the into late July, not a ton of things happen, but a few things of note before we start talking about the wreckage itself. First, those five days in time, this this all took place. Remember, Mac Brazel was being held in uh, for f- about five yeah, days by like, the army. They were like, you fucked up, son. Yeah. Let's well, deprogram you or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, they were trying to convince him. Uh, on top of that, they're trying to convince him that he saw nothing as well as the repeated questions. But on top of that, the other excuse people put forward is much like before, they were trying to keep, uh, much like they did with uh, the officer that they left in the other state for a day. They were trying to keep Brazel out of the public eye for a while until the press died down. And then when the press stopped caring, then they let him back out. I don't know if that's, you know, true or not, but it's just one of those things. I don't, I don't know. Was the media cycle really like that quick in 1947? Yeah, right? well, in Roswell it was because Roswell's tiny. So the news popped off super fast. And once the army got involved, that's when national press just fucking went with it and exploded. But again, Fair enough. Fa- flying saucers are things that are hap- starting to happen a lot now. On top of that, on the 10th, this is 10th of July, by the way, uh, that we're talking about um, <clears throat> the next day. The one important thing that happened on the 10th of July is that Major Pritchard from Alamogordo, I said that right, thank God, Alamogordo claimed that there had been a unit from his base in Roswell that had launched balloons around June 14th. That was what was found by the rancher Brazel, Braz- Braz- undoubtedly. So that's what they claimed now now whether that's true or not who knows and brazil's the first one brazil's the first crash correct yeah ranch crash yeah the one where they loaded it into a super fortress correct and and carried it to back to washington the one, the one where brazil initially said that he found it five or th- four or five days before and then his news story was three weeks before i sound like a broken record but it just is so unbelievable to me that that's what that was yeah so continuing on on friday the 11th uh, that's when debriefings of the army really began taking place on a wide scale. And this is according to Frank Kaufman. Uh, they were taken into a room in small groups and then told that the recovery event was highly classified. Nobody was ever to talk about it and they best forget it if they knew what was good for them. Beyond that, the rest of the week goes pretty easy. And we're kind of going to scoot away now from the rest of that event and move on to the wreckage. We're going to do the post event afterward, but where we want to focus our attention on, cause that's kind of like, like I said, that kind of ends the events of July. That's it. Um, but it's the wreckage itself that I also, this kind of, we go into crazy town with the symbols. And if you would believe that this is true, what this material was like. So remember the materials of the crash site were handed off multiple times, especially the first one. It was brought out to a family at some point and by, by an officer and then given and handed to a bunch of people. So these are a collection of what the, um, the people who supposedly played with it, saw it, and experimented with it say that the material was like when they handled it. And these are all testimonies. Correct. Well after the fact. Oh, yes. Well after the fact. Yes, okay. 1991, I believe, is when we started to get some of the more in-depth information on, on the on the symbols specifically. And do we know Can why they decided like, to, like, wait that long? The army was threatening was their a, lives. Well, I think there was, like, a TV special or something around that time. Well, that's that, in the late 80s. It's when um, What's-His-Face from the radio started to do the whole, like, UFO investigations. Art and Bell? Whatnot. Art Bell, there you go. That's sorry. His name kind of fell out of my head there. But I remember there being, like, some sort of, like, Roswell doc in the 90s that was, like, yeah. like a watershed thing. I don't know if they're I don't know if they're connected, but I remember, like, there was something about that time period that I'm like... It might have been, like, it's 60 years later. They don't care about the death threats anymore. Or, like, you know, I can imagine, at least for a few while, if we... We are to take uh, the accounts as fact, and they were threatened by the military. 
that'd be enough to shut me up for a while at the very least. It reminds me of that thing that I was talking about, about how there's the whole, you know, myth making and yeah. it, 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 it feels like the nineties were that time period. And then all of a sudden it became popular to talk about it. So I am very wary going into this to believe anything of what's about to be said. It, yeah, and I will say for the audience, if there is a point in the story where you want to, where I even would say be wary, it's the wreckage part. Not saying that there wasn't wreckage, but just the, the explanation of to how it was and the way it worked and how bizarre it was. I'm but ready also, for the symbols. Symbols. Let's do it. Symbols. So, uh, <laughs> first, the material was extraordinarily light, similar to aluminum or lead foil in appearance. When it crinkled, it would flatten itself. It would not burn could not be cut or destroyed. Again, we talked about that a little bit in episode one, but to reiterate, you could literally crinkle the material and then it would just pop back out and just be smooth. And you and could if just it needs to drive a car, it. it turns into Robert Patrick. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I don't get the reference. I'm sorry. It's the T-1000. Oh, <laughs> God, of course. Uh, anyway, um, an, an, an extremely light material that was like balsa wooden appearance, but couldn't be cut, burned, or whittled it was pliable also, but it wouldn't break. So it was like, like infinitely it looked pliable. like wood. Hmm? Yeah, it looked like, like it, it looked like wood in appearance, but like a, an aluminum style kind of like wood. It's weird. It's weird when you think about it. So like cars, but okay. when they have wood paneling on them. Yeah, man, this is like a, a Volkswagen UFO. This was a family coming out on vacation to Earth. They got a flat tire. They they swerved. They crash. And then a bunch of freaking, you know, natives started poking them and waving at them and trying to talk at them, and they were scared. That's fair. On top of that, a thread-like material that was described as looking like silk, but rather than having individual fibers like standard textiles, it was one strand like a cable. It had also been described as a monofilament fishing line or perhaps something akin to fiber optics. And I imagine seeing this in the 40s, I mean, it wouldn't be too surprising just look like a string to you. But here's where the weirdness comes in. On the I-beams of the, supported cra- uh, of the supposed crashed vehicle, there were writings on the wall. It wasn't in a known language, and it was described as hieroglyphics by the people that had seen it. It was repeatedly described as being written in pink or purple. And here, uh, if anybody's on the outline, I'll, you know what, let me grab the picture. Um, and let me, I'll, Did I'll anybody it, talk about that on the day? Uh, I don't actually know because these drawings are from 91 i don't we didn't no we didn't hear about these hieroglyphics until the early 90s when all this was coming out that's when we heard about these hieroglyphics not before uh the and the military has not said anything about it i don't know where i can drop this or or how i can do this but you can you see it alex oh you know what i can do it like this i am an internet man dude we all are and we are internet men all of us here it's gonna go in the zoom chat gentlemen here you go okay those are the symbols that were drawn from memory. I was about to say, yeah, okay, from memory. <laughs> have you guys have you guys seen the movie Stargate? Yes, of course. This looks like like if you're out there listening to us <laughs> driving to work or something, and you're thinking to yourself, "What the fuck do those symbols look like?" It looks like if the designers of the game pieces from Sorry tried to make Stargate hieroglyphs i kind of, i don't even see, think that's I saw lucky charms i th- i think you're both wrong it is literally here's what it is for people watching at home or i guess listening at home banana emoji eight <laughs> l eight eight it is just dead ass an eight. eight yeah uh a, a four leaf clo- or a three leaf clover i guess four leaf clover uh the chicken emo the chicken leg emoji uh <laughs> a box with a circle in it a game piece the flexing emoji <laughs> A, the sorry game piece yeah, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. A flexing emoji, a zero, and then an hourglass. That's literally these are pre emojis. All right, I'm Alex, not, now I'm I need not you. sure. I'm convinced this is not from the future now. I think this <laughs> right, might Alex, have been a future you dip person. Into your improv training, and now I need you to translate this for me. What the hell does it say? Seal, sideways butt, corn cob. <laughs> <laughs> shamrock <laughs> i love that they decided to write that in their ship that's that's the magic that gets it to fly seal side <laughs> maybe, it says, maybe it says like you know maybe it says like lexus or like you know like hyundai elantra i have to start with a b for you banana know? yeah it's, know, it's, it's called the uh the gleep glorp 
<laughs> Glubenhofer. The Gleep the Glorp, 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 Glubenhofer Glubin is actually a Hoffer. great model. Fantastic safety record. They do not yeah, crash. I think it's they do not crash. I, look. This looks like if maybe like in another reality, like PlayStation decided to use different shapes for the <laughs> yes. controller. Like it's 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 just very I don't know. I, like what is it? What does it say? I couldn't tell that, you. And that's but the, I, that's that, that's the problem with this though. When you look at it, look at it. It is human shapes. These are not abstract in the sense that like we wouldn't like these are things that if you said to me, Jesse, what did you see on the ship? And I was like, oh boy, I gotta lie about this. And I started making symbols. This is the kind of shit I'd make. These are not <laughs> real alien symbols. Gun to your um, head. Um, <laughs> eight. Um, <laughs> circle. Oh man! Banana with so exclamation <laughs> point. Yeah, <laughs> chicken but fingers. But you know what though? I feel like they were influential. Like looking at these, like I know it's a shitty like s- chicken scratch scribbling of of these symbols that were like probably like printed in metal, <laughs> right? But like if you look at like any sort of like post nineties alien thing, like any sci fi thing, like their writing looks exactly like that shit. Now they, you know they specifically say, by the way, it wasn't like in the metal. They said it was. It looked like it was written in pink or purple. Yeah, like, like maybe something. it was like like you know when you <laughs> buy a when you buy a car and it's like on the back, it's like it says the name of the car. Like yeah, right? yeah, that's exactly yeah. This was the company name of the of the UFO they were flying. I got you. Yeah, that le- that's it's like all a prayer. we have as far as the wreckage. But we now move to the bodies, which I find fascinating because I want to believe so bad. However, it's important to note going forward with these bodies, much like the, the wreckage, the, uh, the information we have is a collection of different pieces of information. If, if we are to believe what is written and what has been reported is that the bodies were all individually um, autopsied by different physicians that, were speciali- that specialized in different parts of the body. So, you know, somebody who was specifically good at, you know, the tor- like knew the torso inside and out, his job was the torso. Somebody else might have the limb. Somebody else might have the head. And but how can we have an expert on any sort of alien? Well, they'd be human experts. Right. They were experts on human anatomy and just hopefully it translates to whatever it is they had. So the, uh, the person who collected these uh, accounts, a man by the name of Leonard Stringfield, he uh, went to all these supposed uh, physicians that were there. And what we have here are literally just a collection of different, of different interviews. And we're just going to piece it together for you as one. So this might, these aliens might sound familiar to you as we move forward. The aliens themselves were of a height somewhere between three and a half and four feet and four and a half feet tall. The head themselves by human standards would be oversized in comparison to the torso and its limbs. Although brain capacity has not been specified, it is considerably larger comparatively than that of the possessed by human beings. So they got a big old cranium. They got a big old noggin. Um, the brain is or the head There's is? more room for a brain. They don't know. Okay. They didn't get info as to how big the brain was. We don't, we don't okay. even know if they have a brain. Um, the head and body are absolutely and completely smooth as a baby bottom. No fuzz, no hair, nothing. Purely smooth. Uh, the eyes were huge, a large oval shaped, sunken, far apart, and slightly slanted. So over to the side of the head, you know, kind of a typical gray. They had no earlobes or extending flesh beyond apertures noted on each side of the head, which one one might believe to be maybe ear holes or where ears once were before they were before they evolved beyond the need for them. If anybody believes that grays are psychic in nature, their nose is formless with nares indicated by only slight protuberance. So where the nose should be just a tiny little bump is uh, what they've got. The mouth is a small slit, which may not function as an orifice for food ingestion. But there was no mention in the reports of teeth uh, of teeth made by Stringfield's informants. So those who were who were telling him these things didn't say anything about teeth. Well, what do we? What, what's there instead? Is it just like a hole? That, it's just a slit. It's a slit for a mouth, and we don't like. They, they said they might not even be used to eat food. We don't know what it's for, and we don't well, know. It if just looks teeth. like like somebody just took like an exacto knife and just yeah, just kind of yeah, right in there exactly. Their neck is also relatively thin, while their arms and legs are extraordinarily thin, with arms reaching nearly down to their knees section. So this fits, you know, earlier descriptions of greys, as they have the long arms that are just near it, or the Dover Demon, as we covered in our live show. 
If you yeah, remember the I, Dover Demon, he had that big head. His arms were down to his knees. He was tiny. Um, same, I remember same thing. there was like a thing that ended up being fake that came out like I think after this. A picture like, maybe? No, no. It was with what's his name? Uh, Commander Riker. Um, what's his name? Oh, uh, um, you're talking about Jonathan Frakes? Jonathan Frakes. It was Jonathan Frakes hosting, and it was like somebody had a video of an alien being autopsied. Mm, okay, yes. There's so many of those different ones out there. There was but a this famous one, was one like, but it was like debunked was like on run, TV. Right? Mega debunked. Th yeah, this, yeah. Well, actually, I think what happened was the guy was like, okay, so what you guys saw was actually a recreation of footage that I watched in the 90s. Right. Debunked. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Debunked. Mega that's fake. What makes doing, that's what makes UFO research so frustrating is because there's a thousand of uh, bad actors out there who are just doing random shit. Now, we're going to move on to their fingers and we're going to get learn a little details that I don't think you boys probably know about the greys and just how they're kind of like their anatomy is. Their hands show four fingers but no thumb with two fingers double the length of the others. They have fingernails that were actually elongated and a slight webbing effect exists between their fingers. So they got a little bit of webbing that goes between the bottoms of their fingers. Almost four maybe fingers thumb. and no thumb, no thumb. And two of their fingers are way longer than the other. They're usually like maybe middle two. Um, the skin itself had a tuft texture and was grayish skin on some of the preserved bodies appeared dark brown, evidently charred by the crash. Their blood is liquid, but not similar to human blood by color or any known blood type at all. There was conflicting reports on reproductive organs, with some observers reporting no distinguishing sex characteristics, while others stated that there were distinctive male and female bodies sexually comparable of human beings. So, you this mean is, like this a is penis hugely, and a vagina? And yes. Boobs? Yep. Which I know sounds weird, and it's weird that there be conflicting reports. But there's also conflicting ex, ex, uh, ex, um, abduction scenarios with uh, greys. Some of them have weirdly human-like figures. And if greys are somewhat psychic in nature, maybe they're seeing the same thing, but they're seeing something different because their brain is trying to interpret what they're seeing and make it as human as it can. Or, the, also or they're lying. Or they're lying is also possible. <laughs> I mean, you know, we can make it's excuses. A possibility. Or they're lying. <laughs> it could be. It's possible. But I mean, every, you know, we could be dreaming right now. You know, it's you never know. Yeah, we could be in the Matrix, dude. You know, man, I was blown away. But yeah. Well, anyway, let's not talk By about the Matrix. Me. Yeah. When I was young, when I saw it, I was okay. like, maybe we are in the Matrix, dude. I, I think that's a legit theory. You yeah. Know, simulation I don't think that's, theory. I'm going to propose yeah. another theory. What does it matter? That's it exactly. You're, yeah. You know what I mean? The steak tastes good. What does it yeah, matter? Exactly. What does I'm it matter? You. Um, give me that red pill. I don't care. Right so, now. I'm not, I, you know, if it, may, if it turns out this is actually not real, I'd be good at, at, at unjacking at this moment. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I'd like to get out of my little nutrient pod in my like weird, like, I don't know, like future D&D &D peasant clothes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the last bit of information Where did that is that fiber come from, by the way, just why didn't it just look like shitty old human clothes? That's like why? <laughs> like why? I, whatever why weren't they matter. naked they've been naked all their lives i'm just i have questions robots are na robots don't have penises they don't care yeah we're growing in tanks it doesn't matter are we ready to finish roswell part two <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> sure whatever sure <laughs> finally uh stringfield was to, uh has said that they he was unfortunately given no information on their internal organs so we have zero info as to how they work internally that way um we just have physical descriptions of their bodies basically yeah finally the mortician from Roswell, Glenn Day, uh, Davis, gave an interview to Stanton Friedman in 1978, where he related the description of the alien bodies at the, at the Roswell Army Airfield given to him by a nurse who he ran into when he stumbled into the, into the situation. We talked about that a little bit ago. But his little explanation that he got from the nurse, again, the nurse unnamed, we don't even know if she's real, is the following. The aliens looked small, fragile, with no hair. Noses didn't protrude, eyes set pretty deep, Ears were indentations, upper arm longer than the lower arm, no thumbs, four different tentacles, no fingernails, suction cups on their fingertips, no sex organs, and a large head. That was the report from the nurse, when she, what Pretty she said consistent. she saw. What? Okay. 
And that's, remember, that's an interview from 12 years earlier, 20 years earlier, almost. 1978 was uh, the interview. This was the interview was given by uh, the local mortician. And again, the local mortician said, this is what the nurse told him, but we don't know if the nurse was even real. So weirdly similar though, to like the other accounts from later with the exception of tentacles, suction cups on their fingers. Well, and I mean stuff, like yeah. the tentacles, if you're, if you have no thumb, which already is like fucked up, but if you have no thumb and, uh, you know, two of your fingers are like double the length of the other ones. Like I could see somebody seeing that as tentacles. Yeah. You maybe. Know what I mean? yeah, I'm with you. Um, but that's where we're going to leave Roswell part two gentlemen. Next, that is both crashes up to the recovery and up to the cover up that we know and every little detail that I could get prior. Next episode, the final episode of Roswell, we are going to cover the Majestic 12, who they are, why they exist, and what they did with the alien races after the Roswell inf- incident, if we are to believe that it was indeed aliens. But that's the it. craziest thing is how generic it all sounds. I'm so sorry. Like, no, you're big. Because it was it, the OG. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, this is the one where all that sh- this shit comes from. So I hope as you're listening to this and you're thinking about this, you realize, like, this is the real one. Like, I know it, it kind of seems like, what? This is the story of Roswell? It's like, yes, but the reason that the it, it does, it sounds like run of the mill is because it is the mill. It's the. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. very true. Um, also, I didn't know uh, July 8th was Roswell's anniversary. That was the event. And obviously, I, I, when we were doing the research, but when we popped up the episode, I was like, oh, wow. We hit we're it like right, right on time. In there. I didn't even realize. Sweet. Serendipitous. We're going to leave it there. We've got a mini-sode to go record. So thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Jesse, I'm curious. Now that the event is done, we go into some things that are v- even more questionable so far. What do you think of uh, what you now know of Roswell? And what do you think of the event? Uh, I think that I know nothing new Mm, okay. Um, but not that I don't, not that it isn't new information. It's just that it's been so popularized. Like Alex was saying, mm-hmm. it's the yeah, of course. event. Um, the things that you have said that I'm like, all right, well, that's interesting. Are also things that I'm like, that it also sounds like total BS. Uh, yeah. There's a lot in there. And, and it's the problem where it's, it's a lot of people want to jump on the Roswell train. Cause the Roswell train was the first money train in all no, also of true paranormal ufology, all that stuff. Like all of it, started here really really this is the the it main really point did. and you know either deathbed confessions and all and people are just like well of course why would they lie on their deathbed but like <laughs> you know i <laughs> i don't know y'all i don't know people do d- crazy things mm-hmm. it's certainly a significant it's a i think it's a it gets it gets less cred for being a significant cultural event for america than it than it than it actually is because it really is significant to our culture in a lot of ways. It really, especially now when we live in this age of like people who are like, you know, willing to believe like crazy theories over like facts and science. A lot of the time, like that, that like little special something that puts America in that mind state, it like starts here. And, uh, you know, it's because it's, 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 it's so, it, it feels so American to me. It's so weird. (laughs) Roswell is so OG. It is an OG. It's American as apple pie and baseball. Like this is one of yeah, and the government Absolutely. hasn't given us any reason to ever trust it, right? Yeah. At least in yeah, the last exactly. fifty years, this seems like an absolute. Like if you believe in conspiracy, if you're a person right now who's just like, let me tell you about vaccines, right? If that's on your <laughs> radar, then you it becomes very easy to be like, well, of course, because of Nixon and Hoover, and you know all the scheming that goes on the last since I've been alive. Almost every president has had something that then later came out that was like, why did the they way, do yeah. that? Yeah. And it was, and sometimes it's not terrible, but it's like, you probably should have told us though, right? Like that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and, and I, I, I'm going to say every president, I'm not going to say almost everyone. I was trying to think of a president that didn't, but since I've been alive, every president has done something that was like, wow, that probably isn't a good thing you did and you hit it and it only came out <laughs> yeah. after you were president. Like that kind of shit happens all the time. And so I can understand why people don't trust government because uh, strangely in the United States, it doesn't always work for us all the time. Weird yeah, how, how weird. that is. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's wild. Well, this has been a blast. I'm glad we're getting this done. We're going to go record our mini. So thank you guys so, so much for the support over on Patreon. And of course, over uh, wherever you listen to the podcast, if you enjoyed it, drop us a rating. It goes a long way for the podcast. Um, 
If you guys want to reach out to us, you can do so at Chaluminati Pod on Twitter. And we all have individuals as well. I'm Matt the, at Mathis Games. Uh, Alex is at Fasian AA. And Jesse's at Jesse Cox. And then uh, the Reddit, the subreddit has a tons and tons of user stories over there. So go check that out. There's a lot of more stuff you can go uh, fill your mind with. And we are going to go do the mini-sode. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Peace out.